Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. You have the cover story here. It is because I'm, I'm out of the actual physical copies. Maybe you have a physical copy there of the latest issue, yeah. Skeptic. So um, there there it is. Yeah, in the beginning, cosmic inflation, the multiverse, and the nature of scientific proof. So when I commissioned you to do this long, uh, I don't know, many months ago now, last year actually, um, you know, this was before. Uh, I even knew that Stephen Meyer was writing this book, uh, The Return of the God Hypothesis, or that Michio Kaku was coming out with a book, uh, The God Equation. Note the similarities of the covers. So after you finish with your yeah. Galileo book, you, you need to write a God book uh, and, and have some cover like that. <laughs> um, so, you know, the topics you cover in, in, the, in the cover story of Skeptic really have nothing to do with theism and God and religion. That wasn't the purpose of it. it uh, you know, I just wanted to know what's the latest on the biggest questions, where the universe came come, came from and, you know, why does it appear to be fine-tuned and, 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 you know, what's the the shape of the universe and what is time and, you know, all those those great questions, which to me, those are scientific questions and, and you're a scientist. And uh, But, you know, it's you don't have to dig very deep to realize, well, they do have theistic implications because you, you can't help but wonder, well, where did it all start and therefore is there something like a sentient mind behind it all um, so let's start there I mean uh, you just had uh, Stephen Meyer on your podcast and I listened to the whole thing it was great conversation and so I, I it, it, for an outsider like me I, I'm, I'm not a, I'm a social scientist not a physicist so I don't really know I kind of trust you guys the experts to tell me what's the latest debate and is there consensus on this theory or that theory or, or is there no consensus and so on so when someone like you reads Stephen Meyer's book that makes a you know a really strong case for behind it all, behind the Big Bang, behind the fine tuning, the co- co- cosmological constants and 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 and, and all that, uh, if he had such a convincing argument, you know why don't you convert? <laughs> that is to say, why don't you go? Oh yeah, he's right. I, I, I I'm now a theist, and maybe I'm even a Christian because. It, not in his this book, but right. elsewhere yeah. they, they, they they then go from the design universe and the designer to, you know, Jesus really died for your sins and the whole thing, and, and you become a Christian. So the fact that you and, and and other professional scientists who would read his book or his previous books or other books by uh, Bill Dembski and others in the intelligent design movement have not converted or become theists, why not? Uh, how do you know that? Uh, actually, uh, I'm late for my uh, my church. Uh, oh. I converted not only to be a to be a theist, but now I am uh, I converted from Judaism to Christianity. No, I I didn't do that. And actually, I told him that because he Michael, that book is huge. You're holding up uh, uh, Stephen Meyer's book, and uh, when he I received it in my mailbox here at UCSD in December, mid December or no early December, and it said, Dr. Keating, I love I love your work. I love it if you would consider endorsing this book. And, oh, by the way, it'd be great to have it by next Thursday. I was like, okay, well, at least you gave me seven full days to read. You know, it's like 80 pages a day the way that Stephen writes. I said, absolutely, I can't do that. I'm happy to have a conversation about maybe doing it. But I need to have the following conversation with you, Stephen. I said, I have a problem with people like uh, those of uh, your fellow uh, folks that travel in ID and in so-called Christian apologetics, and that said, I'm Jewish. I'm a practicing Jew. I call myself a devout agnostic, and I'll, I can explain what that means. But uh, but the but the fact is, a lot of times I'll hear the following set of logical syllogisms: that everything that began had a beginner, everything that began had a purpose, and therefore Jesus. So in other words, the universe had a beginning. Uh, the universe must have had a beginner, namely a God. And therefore, that God had some purpose, and therefore, the God is personal, and the God also formed in the form of the tripartite God, Jesus Christ, to not only exist in um, uh, for for the creation of the universe, but also for my own personal redemption. I said, I'm a Jew. I don't accept that. I accept that Jesus existed. I accept that he. We even know who his rabbi was in the Talmud. You know, there's no better source of documentation of ancient Judea and Samaria than the Talmud. We know who his rabbi was. We know who that guy's rabbi was, etc. There's no doubt that he existed. The question of ours to his faith claims and the actual the- the- uh, theistic, theistic implications of believing in such an entity. So I said, <clears throat> um, along the way, I'm going to tell you 
that I read this as a cosmologist, and I find uh, oftentimes with L William Lane Craig in particular that uh, it's sort of uh, this this it, it borders on uh, confirmation bias. It borders on manipulation of evidence to support a conclusion, and that conclusion always ignores the existence of alternative cosmologies, of which there are many. And in this uh, article for the cover issue of Skeptic Magazine this quarter, I want to flesh out the fact that it is by no means settled that there was a Big Bang. Now listen, I said a Big Bang, mm -hmm. because it seems to me that if there were multiple Big Bangs, that doesn't give more support for a creator, it might even give less support for a creator. And I wanted to bring to bear the full brunt of today's modern understanding of theoretical cosmology and potential alternative stories to the Genesis 1-1 narrative, which, by the way, Michael, you should know, that was resisted. I'm sitting in the office of a man by the name of Jeffrey Burbage, uh, who passed away 10 years ago, 11 years ago. Jeffrey worked with Fred Hoyle, and they were long-term uh, proponents of the steady state model until his death. In fact, their number one uh, protege, one of Hoyle's foremost graduate students, his name is Jayant Narlakar, and he uh, lives today, thankfully, he's in Pune, in Pune, India, and I interviewed him for my podcast, Into the Impossible. And he still believes in the steady state, and he still believes the reasons that the Big Bang are believed in, if you can believe it, somewhat owes to the fact that it comports with Genesis 1-1. So listen very carefully what I'm saying. They are saying that quasi-steady state and steady state theorists, which are the principal alternative to the Big Bang, their foremost proponents believe that my colleagues in the cosmology wing of this university believe in the Big Bang only because they're overwhelmed by the Genesis 1-1 narrative. What could be wow. more kind of ludicrous to a practicing cosmologist? And wow. yet there are many alternatives to this very moment <laughs> to the standard origin story that has a single Big Bang. And it's actually one of the most interesting areas of cosmology to work in. The question is, can we prove it? And I thought it'd be fun to talk about proof uh, and, and, yeah. and the limits of yeah. the proof, because yeah. that's sort of the outcome of, the, of this discussion. And, and and you know, you say kind of uh, dismissively, oh, I'm just a social scientist. You're much more than a social scientist, Michael. You understand the currency of science revolves around the centuries old scientific method which has at its core some level of confrontation of a model or a theory with evidence. And nowadays, Michael, what's troubling me so much, I had on Michio Kaku, I know you did on your podcast, I pushed on him as a physicist, you pushed on him in really interesting ways that kind of complemented with aliens and with, with uh, you know, traversing your, your avatar at the speed of light. I thought you did a wonderful job in ways I could not. But on the cosmological side, we are left with an essentially infinite number of possible universes according to both the multiverse and string theory. And I said, I find this dangerous. I find hmm. it dangerous for the scientific method. Yeah, interesting. Um, yeah, just to put a, an extra point on that, someone like a Stephen Meyer, although he hasn't said this to me, but others have, well, Shermer, if you understood the, the, the quantum physics, or if you knew the equations, or if you, you understood inflationary cosmology, which you don't, you'd see that, you know, I'm right about this particular argument. Well, you could say that about me. <laughs> and you could even say, well, and you're a public atheist, so of course, you're not going to accept these arguments for theism. Yeah, well, you can't say that about you, Brian Keating, because you, you're not a rabid militant atheist. And, and you are a cosmologist, or, and you certainly can't say this about, say, someone like um, uh, the, the head of the, uh, the Human Genome Project and, uh, uh, and National Institutes of Health. Um, what's his name? His name just escapes me right now. Uh, no, 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 not Francis Crick. Crick. Not Francis Crick. Um, oh. Um, uh, anyway, it'll come to me. Um, you know, he's an evangelical Christian, and he, and he headed the the Human Genome Project, right? So he understands genetics and and uh, and, and complexity of life, or uh, and, and so on. There are theists and atheist cosmologists. So, uh, in other words, I kind of lean on this consensus theory of how science works. That you know, we're scientists who have Francis been. Francis Collins. Francis Collins. Yeah, Collins. that's right. No, yeah, Francis Collins. Thank you. 
<laughs> yeah, it's, it's hell getting old. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> you know, for, when, we the when, when you talk about something like, you know, consensus science and climate science or the Big Bang cosmology or the theory of evolution, you know, it's not like these guys are all media on the weekends to get their story straight because those intelligent designers or, or those liberal uh, Democrats are going to try to destroy American economy. So they have to have this this uh, global warming thing, you know, they work independently of one another and in competition often for grants and, and journal space and so on. So they're trying to debunk each other such that an outsider like me can go, OK, the fact that they've reached consensus is a signal to me that, you know, they're probably going along the right track here. Uh, on, by contrast, if things are just kind of if the steady state and Big Bang theories were still kind of 50 50 and you guys couldn't make up your mind after 50 years, I begin to think. I wonder if there's a problem here. Like, again, the string theory, why, why I pushed Michi on this topic, and you know, how can you test it? Uh, because, you know, it's, you guys have had decades and decades, and there seems to be no consensus. You know, what is there a conceptual problem here with how you're approaching it? Again, I don't know anything about string theory, but I can kind of see how science tends to work. So that's why I wanted to ask you that, you know, that kind of that big question. If someone like Stephen Myers has such a convincing argument, why aren't scientists going, okay, then he's right. We have to follow this track. Maybe you don't have to become a Christian. But you, could, you could become well, a theist, yeah, something I mean, like that. To, to give him his fair shake, you know, I, I personally don't believe many of the people who profess to believe in theistic explanations truly believe in theism uh, based on behavior of, of, of you know, people that I, that I witness. Not to say that I'm literally holier than thou in any case, but I think, you know, there's, there's such an extreme, you know, almost like unconscionable burden. Like I, I once thought like, how could a vegan brush their teeth? You know, like <laughs> you're killing all these microbes. And, uh, you know, it's like I think, you know, ridiculous ad absurdum uh, certainly mm. would apply. But I think, you know, in Stephen's case, he you know, I think he is obviously very convinced, but he also has the intellectual honesty, at least to admit that he can't prove it. Mm -hmm. And I push back in several different directions. So one is the the lack of uni unanimity, I would say, and lack of um, of a dearth. In other words, there are many plausible alternatives to the standard Big Bang model. Second of all, even the models that he espouses in the book, well, <clears throat> sorry, even the models that he espouses in the book have serious lacunae in them that mm. make them either untestable, unprovable, uh, unverifiable, and subject to the multiverse um, kind of out paradigm. Uh, but they're they're tentative in a way that they cannot even be expected to have falsifiable evidence against them. Hmm. Now, I thought it'd be interesting for us to talk about Karl Popper for mm -hmm. a second. Yeah, uh, you're not in the, you're not a physicist, but you know Karl Popper has enormous influence on science. Even though, you know, and Stephen actually, you know, brought this out because I, I did push back at one point and we did talk about popperism and I knew this. But, you know, by by the by the demarcation, you know, uh, uh, assay, by the by the statement that you can judge if a theory is scientific via the ability for it to be falsified, that that is the sine qua non is no longer held by even philosophers of science, mm -hmm. let alone should be held by scientists. I claim that's because that it is held sacrosanct, Michael. I claim that's because physicists, remember, did you ever hear like, well, you must have heard of penis envy, uh, and I know we can we can say such words, but there's also something called physics envy, where the some of the sciences had envy of how rigorous mm -hmm. physics can be. But actually, I think physicists have mathematics envy mm. because we cannot prove the boundaries of what we do or do not know in the Gerdelian sense, in the sense that we don't have an incompleteness theorem for physics because we don't prove things. I mm. never go out and prove things. That's not what I do. We just disprove things. So um, so physicists, in lieu of that, have resorted to Popper, mm. have saying, and they kind of have this, even though Popper himself said, it's sometimes very useful for a theory to remain untestable, maybe for some time, because it allows uh, a hardening, kind of an annealing of the true theory to come out. My question is, we live in reality. <laughs> we, Although many of our listeners may not believe that, <clears throat> we have to get jobs, <clears throat> we have to get grants, we have to teach students. And in so doing, we need resources. And those resources can only be allocated in a finite sense. There's a, a science I always say, Michael, lately I've been saying this, and again, you've been so influential on me as a podcaster, as a thinker, and, and I'm you know delighted to be a part of Skeptic now. 
<clears throat> it's funny, you know, uh, having an article in Skeptic and also a, a video for Prager University. I think that that might be unique, <laughs> although I'm not yes. quite sure. In the same month, <laughs> right. uh, but, but nevertheless, um, you know, thinking about you know what what is the ultimate limit of what we do? I mm -hmm. say nowadays, science is not an infinite is not a finite game. It's not a winner takes all game where I'm right, therefore Michael's wrong, and then we just go on. But funding sure is. There's mm. only so much funding. There's a finite mm. amount of funding. There's a zero sum funding, and just like there is for uh, for podcasts. I mean, we can only listen to one podcast at a time. So how do you divide your attention, the most valuable commodity of all, and how do you divide these resources? And so in reality, string theory and inflation, these twin pillars of modern day cosmological physics now are sort of dominant for almost 40 years uh, and to the exclusion of almost any other paradigm receiving funding attention and and perhaps the resources that it needs to provide so should it be surprising that we find ourselves in a situation where these are touted as proven and i find that again kind of dangerous for mm -hmm. the progress in physics that i hope to agenda yeah, I think of, uh, just to close the door of how I opened was, I, I think of these kinds of arguments that intelligent design creationists make as vastly superior to the old arguments made by the young earth creationists, say in the 60s and 70s, and in the Gish Gallup when Dwayne Gish would plow through 300 slides and then give you five minutes to respond. Uh, those kinds of arguments, you know, these guys have greatly improved on that. Um, and, uh, and yet, I, I think... They're good arguments if you already believe. That is, if you're already a theist, particularly yeah. if you're a Christian and you believe that, uh, you know, that a, a sentient being uh, of, of omniscient and omnipotent power, you know, created the universe and us and cares about us and so on. All these arguments are, are pretty good. I mean, it's like, yeah, yeah, they're very reinforcing in, in, a, in a Bayesian kind of way. I already believe, so I'm piling up more and more con confirmatory evidence for my beliefs. And then to, to the Bayesian right. thing, I think fal pa Paparian falsification is just one element of science. Uh, scientists do reason in a Bayesian way, where you guys are trying to up, update your priors. So you run an experiment, and the experiment comes out one way or the other. If it comes out in a positive way, that that kind of up, ups your, your your prior to the credence of your theory being true, true with a small t, uh, n n no no capital T's. And I think what's particularly confusing to a lot of us, again outsiders, is that the areas you working in uh, that you work in are so. Um, sort of abstract or, you know, non-concrete. Um, so I'll, I'm going to read something to you here from Steven Pinker uh, that he wrote me in a, in, a, in a little group email. After I had Michio Kaku on the podcast, a couple of my cycling friends who listen to the podcast emailed me commenting on what I just said. This stuff is also abstract, you know, Higgs boson and the inflationary this and the flatness of the universe or what? What? You know, and so uh, and, and so Steve made th this observation, which, you know, he's just so, so good at this sort of thing. Um, he says, it seems to me uh, that any ultimate theory in fundamental physics is going to be hard to test because at some point we're bound to ask questions that just happen to be inconvenient or impossible for mortal humans to study for practical reasons. For example, you can't build a particle accelerator the size of the solar system. But the universe wasn't created for the benefit of scientists, and it may be our bad luck that we don't have the means to build labs to test every theory. That's when elegance, parsimony, consistency, scope, etc., are the only criteria criteria we can apply. And, and then he makes a comment because we, we also discussed the nature of consciousness. It also seems inevitable that at any level of depth, the theory is going to look pretty abstract, almost vindicating a kind of idealism where the only reality is the math. Here, I'm sorry, I'm still continuing with the abstract physics. One wouldn't expect a theory to add a note at the end of its equation. Oh, and there are itty bitty little tiny bits of hard stuff out there corresponding to the seventh term of equation 39. <laughs> and then he says, as a cognitive scientist, I'm always mystified by claims that consciousness can only be explained by some highly abstract or counterintuitive or obtruse theory in physics. That would be called for if ESP existed, but as Michael has documented for decades, it doesn't. 100% of consciousness depends on photons striking rods and cones, vibrating sound pushing against eardrums, neurons transmitting chemicals across synapses and computational networks, etc. If consciousness is sourced directly from fields, here he's referring to like quantum fields, 
based on one theory. Why do we have to turn on the lights and open our eyes to see? <laughs> Such a great comment. So here I'm wondering, you know, are we at a point, you guys, you physicists, theoretical physicists, and cosmologists, where you're just kind of bumping up against the wall of all we have now is math, because we, we can't really test these super abstract theories. Well, there I've got good news and good news, <laughs> because actually we can test the uh, alternatives to say inflation, which produce, produces this, you know, resplendent, extravagant multiverse in the cosmological. So I should say, let me take a step back. There's two different types of multiverses at minimum that physicists talk about, um, and one of the which is uh, is one in a cosmological sense that just as we have multiple planets, we have multiple stars and galaxies, etc. There are multiple universes. So that's just the evolution of the cosmological principle, the Copernican principle. So the, that's something that almost seems um, it almost seems natural that there should be other universes. And of course, there's nothing even in the bounds of ordinary cosmology that precludes there being a universe right next door, as, as some, you know, one quipped once, you know, there's a heck of a universe right next door, let's go. Uh, <laughs> but there could be a universe that's literally, you know, one light day away from our observable universe's boundary, the, the light cone from which we can receive information during the next day. And we'll find out about it splashed across the front page of the New York Times tomorrow, the, <laughs> the, the, the uh, Santa Barbara News Press or the Union <laughs> Tribune. Um, there's another type of multiverse, which is uh, that there are universes separated in space and or in time. And they're separated in many different ways by, uh, by not only their differing uh, physical phenomena that take place. In other words, there could be so many that, you know, I host a, a podcast called the the Brian Keating Show, and you host one called the Into the Impossible Podcast. <laughs> On the other hand, uh, there could be universes where there's six dimensions of space and one of time. There could be universes where the speed of light is slower than our speed of sound, et cetera, et cetera. So there are limits, by the way, to the existence of life forms like ours in the so-called weak anthropic principle sense. But let me ask this question. I, I've been thinking about this one a lot because I don't think this has really been addressed. I asked Michio Kaku about this. And I said, you guys always who talk about the string multiverse, which is the latter form of the multiverse that I just spoke about, you always talk about that as having, you know, the different mass of the proton, the speed of light, the nuclear force will change a little bit. But what's to prevent the laws of logic that modus tollens applies or not in another universe? It seems to mm. me that if you can let everything change and that two plus two could be five in another in another universe, then it's basically hopeless because in that case, you could never potentially test the non-existence or prove the non-existence of such a universe because we would not only lack the experimental tools, you know, what Steven Pinker's talking about is enhancements to our own sensors. Mm. So I, I did a podcast with Deepak Chopra and Leonard Malad now. And I talked about uh, we talked about like I called it sensors and sensibility. You know, it's like what we see is what we interact with. And then you know, Michael's claiming that we don't have any free will because everything's foreordained in the in the uh, or wave function of the universe, whatever that means. And then Deepak saying, no, there's all this quantum decoherence, and and it's like, yeah, grudgingly I have to say, you know, both of them are right and both of them are wrong. Hmm. The problem is we don't observe the universe outside the universe. We are observing it from within. And so we are subject to certain basic tenets, and the lack of our ability to gauge the existence of another universe may be due to physical limitations, namely the finite speed of light, the finite age of the observable universe, et cetera. So I think of these as cosmic chicken or egg problems. Hmm. In other words, which came first, you know, the, the universe or the laws of physics? Because if you ask Lawrence Krauss, who's going to be a guest um, coming up on my podcast for his climate change book, um, I'm, uh, you know, if you ask him, you'll say, oh, the, the laws of physics, you know, and the Vilenkin theorem, which uh, he popularized in his book called uh, A Universe from Nothing, suggests that the universe can emerge, you know, from this, uh, this balance between negative en energy and positive energy, canceling out. So zero means nothing means it can come from nothing. No, that's not actually correct. That's not an interpretation that even Vilenkin recognized. It's merely this, the statement that there had to be a pre-existing universe in the sense of the laws of quantum mechanics, the laws of, of mathematics, etc. What Stephen Meyer gets into is that only such things that have um, boundary conditions, what we call in physics, if, if you look at a pendulum swinging back and forth, Michael, you can't tell me where I started the bob of the pendulum. You can't tell me. 
because you don't know the initial conditions. You just know the total energy in the system, but you don't know the initial conditions. Similarly, you have to know the boundary conditions of a system. You have to know, well, what volume is it contained within? Hmm. And what are the interactions of the measurement apparatus on the subject being measured? So for all these reasons, I find it very difficult to, to, to learn, glean from uh, the current book that we're discussing with Stephen Meyer's book, that because the universe started in low entropy, as many people, if not all people, believe, that that is evidence of order, because that presupposes a pre-existing pre-order. And so I asked him, I said, Michael, why, I said, Michael, I said, Stephen, why is it that of, if you were alive, Michael, in the very early universe, af apart from the first three minutes, the next billion or so years would have been the most boring, mm -hmm. you know, in recorded history. Almost nothing happened. Hydrogen formed over here. That's about it for hundreds of millions of years. And then if you just think about us as our DNA, DNA didn't emerge for a very long time, at least on Earth. We don't understand exactly when the first humans that look like us. So in other words, Everything was created by this mind with a purpose, according to you, Stephen. And yet, why was there, you know, billions of years waiting between events? In other words, the, the clock, you could have, like, looked back and forth. And if you looked every billion years or so, you'd say, this is a pretty slow universe. He didn't have an answer for that. He said, you know, God can create the Hubble Deep Field. He can create anything yeah. he wants. Yeah. Um, so I found that very unsatisfying. Yeah, I did. Probably as unsatisfying I did, I did as, too. as he finds. I'm surprised he didn't come up with something like this, which I've heard. That is to say, to an eternal deity, uh, you know, what difference does it make if it's 14 billion or 14 trillion? Eternity goes way past that. So, you know, whether it's 10 years, 10 million years, 10 billion years, 10 trillion years, they're just they're just zeros after the one. And to an eternal being, it doesn't Mike, really you matter. You have a puppy, right? I have, a, have pu a puppy. I right? have a dog, yeah. You have a dog. So you got that dog when you're in your 50s or whatever. <laughs> like you could ask the same question. Like I waited. Uh, it's not it's not the duration that you do, that you demurred from making a decision or making a phenomena instantiate itself. It's the it's the the relevant time scale is the time scale. And when that thing started to take action and have effect that you as the designer, if you will, of that dog's particular life had a purpose for it. In other words, intelligence you know, there are things that can appear intelligent, but they actually convey no real information to us, right? It's patterns, like a license plate, like Feynman's famous license plate yeah, thing. Yeah, On the yeah. way over to this lecture, yeah, I saw the yeah. following license plate, 6Q7, yeah. 4TV. Oh, that's intelligent. No, it's not. It is absolutely meaningless. It was created by an intelligence, but so too with your dog, I would say what is the, if the purpose of your life up till getting that dog was getting the dog, which it's, it would seem to be if we are the pinnacle of creation, which I can actually take some stock in for practical reasons, not me personally, but but nevertheless, why wait so long? Why but, create but, so many uni uh, uh, but different your, universes? Your point is that if if it's all here for us, why, why wait 14, 13.8 billion years or 13.7, I guess, you know, to create uh, life forms and, and so on? Um, yeah, well, I have the same problem, too, as well as this problem, which I want to ask him about. And he started to go down that path, but then he kind of changed the subject. That is, uh, how does the deity, the intelligent designer, how does God do all this stuff? Yeah. And, and, and I would yeah, push it, I would push it even, see, even see more than this. You know, it's the same problem that Descartes yeah. started uh, with a dualistic... A worldview, how does mind interact with the stuff? Like to, to ghost hunters, I always ask them, how does the ghost know to turn right at the hallway and, and open the door? And, and how does the ghost knock the picture off the wall? The, you know, the ghost is supposedly this non-material substance. It's the same problem we have with right. uh, consciousness. How does a thought cause my muscles to move? Well, you know, the synapses, you know, and, and, the, and the neurons fire and so on. Yeah, but, but how does the thought cause the neuron to fire? Well, other neurons are firing. Right. Yeah, those are just physical systems. If you impute behind that a mind, how does the mind interact with the physical stuff? And so I would just ask, you know, like if God is performing miracles, how does he do it? Does he, you know, reach into the cells and, and, and let's say cure the Aunt Mary's cancer? Does he go into every cell in the tumor and reprogram it so that it dissolves and the tumor gets smaller? It's exactly how does this happen? And, uh, you know, the only answer you're going to get is, well, God works in mysterious ways or nobody knows or, or that's an unanswerable question or I don't know what. Uh, at some now, point. Similarly to push back. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, no, it's good. That's it. Yeah. So, so the yeah, exactly. My my feeling. Uh, you're echoing beautifully, Michael. But I also can push back because I've heard talks by, say, you know, Sean Carroll, and Sean will say things like, "Well, 
um, God is not a good theory. He, of course, is too smart to say there is no God, I can prove it. He'll say the probability of God is less than a few uh, tenths of a percent, but the probability of the multiverse he puts at 50-50, and it depends on what multiverse. I think he believes the multiverse in the Everetti and many worlds uh, conception is is a hundred percent. He believes that is the correct interpretation of quantum mechanics. But nevertheless, just thinking cosmological multiverse, and I'll say to him, well, what is the evidence for that? Well, he says, well, God could and should produce the simplest, most parsimonious universe first, and that um, and that would be an empty universe. In other words, the fact that our universe has mm. stuff in it, stuff mm. that can think of things, is now evidence that God is at least not parsimonious. And I say to him, well, and he says, yeah, just look at the Hubble Deep Field. And I said to him, I said, well, Sean, you know, he was like, look at all those galaxies. You know, even if there is life there, we can never interact with it. And therefore, it's, it's pointless to our existence on Earth. So we cannot be... You know, most people think that Galileo showed we were not the center of the solar system. He didn't do that. He just showed that there are other rightful places that could claim to be the center of the universe. And that was enough to at least disprove the thought that we were the center of the universe, right? Mm -hmm. So it's so he said, well, those galaxies over there have no purpose to us. And if we are the pinnacle of creation, uh, it can't be so that those other things uh, exist for any purpose that matters to us because they don't do anything for us. And I said, well, Sean, the same thing could have been said about uranium in the year 18, you know, mm. 42. Mm. They didn't know about uranium and they didn't know about quantum mechanics and all these four. And by the way, two weeks ago, I had on my podcast uh, someone discussing the, a new potential fifth force of nature mm. discovered at the Large Hadron Collider. That's a force we didn't know about until 2021, mm. if it holds up, which it may or may not. Uh, but the point is that we can uh, we don't not yet know the purpose for many things that scientists discover. And again, I'm pushing back as the theist. Mm -hmm. And I said to I said to you know to Sean I have uh, my upstairs um, uh, professor colleague she studies that galaxy over there in the Hubble Deep Field, and his response was Oh come on, you can't be serious. Like I was like that's a purpose. Like I've just provided you one particular person in the universe for whom that serves a purpose, and you're saying that's not that doesn't qualify as well. So too does the evidence for the pre-existing Hilbert space that contains an empty universe in quantum mechanics that Sean uh, believes in. That is is uh, enough to refute the existence of a designer who had a purpose for us specifically. Mm -hmm. So I found I find you know I, I like to give people grief on both sides, Michael. I don't know is there is there a name for my condition? I like to like push back on both the theists and the atheists. Well, I think that makes me an agnostic. Well, you're, I'm not sure. You, yeah, what, what is a, uh, what do you call it, Mil militant agnostic? I don't know, and you don't either, or something like that. Is that what you are? <laughs> how do you define your, how do you define well, just, agnosticism? Yeah, so I define agnosticism, again, similar, you once told me you don't call yourself an atheist usually because that means you're defining it by what you're not. So I shouldn't define myself by what I'm not, but I will say that I know what like Michio Kaku is not. I know what uh, the late great friend of mine, Freeman Dyson, was not. In other words, they would not go to the same church that Richard Dawkins does not go to. And so there was no functional way for an mm -hmm. intelligent alien, if such exists, to look at Michio Kaku and distinguish him functionally from, uh, from our friend Richard Dawkins. Right. So there's no way to tell in practice which one is which. And so we know that we are the sum of a lot of uh, what impacts us, our behavior. I think uh, you're a behaviorist to some level. I certainly am. And I believe that, you know, behavior is a manifestation of what our worldview is. And so Michio doesn't go to church and and uh, and he may say that he's agnostic, but I kind of feel I wonder, I hope it's not true. Um, that he is like Stephen Hawking, you know, Stephen Hawking put things like the mind of God at the end of his brief history yeah. of time, yeah. and so does Michio Kaku. And I think sometimes that's to not turn off theists. And and I, I hope that's not the case for, for Michio. At least I know it was for Hawking, but um, I'm actually having, you'll like this guy. I'll, I'll, I'll send him over your way if you're interested. Charles Seif at NYU, mm. who wrote uh, Zero, The Birth mm -hmm. of a Dangerous. Mm -hmm. He just wrote a book called Hawking Hawking, and it's about the business of Stephen Hawking hmm. and how he was a Hawking, showman. Hawking. And it's a That's critical, clever. That's clever. It's the yeah. first critical biography of Stephen Hawking, as opposed to all the hagiography hey that exists around him. And one of the pieces of hagiography hey was that he was, you know, he was a kind man and he didn't care if people believed in God. He was pretty militant in all of his books that God did not exist and he could prove it. And his way to prove it, uh, Michael, was one, inflation to invalidate the need for God to establish the mm. universe, mm -hmm. and two, string theory, or what's called M-theory, which is what Michio describes, and that was to instantiate the laws of physics. 
and neither one of which is held as proven or ever could be thanks to even the discussions according even to their proponents such as Alan Guth and uh, Michio Kaku. Here is what uh, Leonard Milad now writes in his memoir of Stephen Hawking. Yep. Uh, so here he is, um, Leonard is quoting Stephen uh, who typed this out to him. A law is not a law if you allow God to intervene, he said. That leaves two possible roles for God. One is to choose the initial condition of the universe. We got rid of that with the no boundary proposal. I wrote about that in A Brief History of Time. The other possible role is for God to be responsible for choosing the laws and making a universe based on those laws. It shall arise in the last chapter of our book that it is not necessary to invoke God for this either. He's referring to uh, the grand design that they wrote together. He, Hawking continues, I want to make my position clear without being violently anti-religion like Richard Dawkins, he continued. I have just been sent the, his book, The God Delusion. If you want to see it, get Judith. I agree with most of it, but I don't think it is necessary to be so aggressive. And then at the end of the memoir, in the closing pages here, Leonard recalls the day that that book came out, The Grand Design, and Stephen's um, secretary or assistant, whoever, calls Leonard and says, Have you seen The Times? she asked. The New York Times, I said. Yes, I'd read it. Not the New York Times, the London Times. Haven't you seen it? And Leonard says, Judith, who here reads the London Times? Well, Google it. Look at the headline. It says, quote, Hawking, God did not create the universe. It's creating a furor. Then Leonard continues, that's wrong, I said. We said God isn't necessary for creating the universe, not that physics proves he didn't. Well, the press is all over it and Stephen can't handle it all. We need your help. You need to do some interviews. <laughs> so, you know, he's basically saying, you know, don't put Hawking in the same category with, with Richard Dawkins in terms of how militant well, but, he is. But, I mean, he was, he, you know, in this book by Charles Seif, Professor Seif, really makes the case that he cultivated that image, but he was much more kind of calculating behind the scenes. Those two mm. things that he talks about, a brief history of time and a grand design, those are accepted 100% by the public and almost 0% by practicing physicists. Really? So it's a total sales drop that... Uh, absolutely. Well, inflation is not is not essentially it's not provable in the sense that you could only, you know, you can't you can't falsify it. As we said earlier, you could not show evidence that's inconsistent with inflation if inflation um, could have existed. So, for example, let's say that there's um, evidence A. Evidence A will occur for inflation enough to uh, provide supporting evidence for it. And if evidence A occurs, that means you can reasonably infer in a Bayesian sense that inflation took place. Well, there's a couple things that could happen. One, inflation didn't happen, in which case you won't see evidence A. Uh, but also, it could be that, uh, that inflation did take place, but it did so in a way as to provide noisy enough data that you can never detect it with confidence level greater than one. So in that mm. case, you'd be in this no man's land and it becomes a matter of taste. That's that applies to the inflationary mm. component that was he brought out. And actually, he didn't play a huge role in inflation. Uh, and this book makes out a big point that Hawking would write papers with people. And in this case, he wrote a paper with my colleague at UC Santa Barbara named James Hartle, the no boundary proposal. And in that, I believe that they probably did or Hawking he would write papers and people would say, yeah, I'll be on the paper with you because mm -hmm. it's going to get a thousand times more citations than if I write it by myself, knowing that Hawking would take all the credit for it. Actually, mm -hmm. Andy Strominger is quoted in this book, who's a renowned professor at Harvard, saying that in his last paper in 2017 or so, he made that calculation and he decided to go with it, even though he knew he'd be written out of the history books for credit. Um, but in the context of the of the no boundary proposal, if you read the book, as I did recently and, and again, I tried to read it when I was 18 when it came out. I couldn't understand it. Now I'm a practicing cosmologist. Like, tr not only is it like not I don't want to say trivial, but it's it's simple for me. And I'm not a theoretical cosmologist, by the way. I'm an experimental cosmologist. But it was simple enough for me to know that he made a very very almost uh, disingenuous trick in that book. And that was in, in, in the calculation where he talks about time not having a beginning and there being nothing north of the North Pole and that being a stupid question. He makes uh, what, what Stephen Meyer points out is ex an exact uh, accuracy. He makes a mathematical uh, approximation. He converts the time domain into what's called imaginary time, mm -hmm. which it doesn't have a physical existence, cannot be measured. It's merely a mathematical trick. If you remember 
anything about imaginary numbers, the imaginary numbers are the square root of negative numbers, which shouldn't exist according to um, you know normal experience with numbers. We don't have a number that's the that's the square root of negative two. It, such a thing doesn't exist. But when you introduce a negative uh, square root of negative one, such things can exist. Hawking does that, and he says, "I'm going to do a little mathematical trick, but it's just a trick." And then later on, he goes, "Because of that trick, now we know that time is imaginary, and time could start with no beginning whatsoever, just like there's no beginning of the of the Earth's surface." It's so disingenuous and, and the worst possible read of it. At hmm. best, it's hmm. like a convenience. It's like saying, I'm going to do like some mathematical you know, gibberish here. And then at the end, I'm going to say, I'll make a conclusion. But I'll go back and I'll remind you, I, I still have to address that. He never addressed that. And hmm. so that is not accepted by almost any working cosmologist today. The, this, the first book, The Brief History of Time. And I ask you, did you come away from your conversation with Kaku being convinced that string theory or M theory is correct, and that's why we have the laws. It's basically the anthropic principle. Yeah. It's saying there's an infinite number of universes. Infinite, because the vacuum of string theory, the lowest possible energy state that a theory can have, is completely undefined within the theory. And here's where I don't like what Kaku does. Kaku says, well, it's not fair to ask that we test string theory today, because we don't know its principles in final form. I know that you're not a physicist, but you know for sure that we don't have a final theory of quantum mechanics e either, right? We don't have we have we have interpretations, we have principles, but you know, you and I wouldn't be talking if we didn't have the laws of physics that govern quantum behavior to produce the transistors in the screen that you and I are conversing through. So it's very different. To, you, mm. you can't say that the lack of a underlying principle is a deterrent, an impediment to getting something useful, like a transistor that produces an image on a screen. Because we have examples where such things occur where we don't understand the principles that govern them at their most basic behavior. So I think that is not an honest assessment of why we should not, why we should abandon the 400 year old scientific method. I came away highly unconvinced. Interesting, yeah. I guess I am too in that version of the multiverse, the string theory version, if I'm getting that right, where there's uh, somewhere there's a version of you and I almost exactly the same in which I have more hair than you instead of vice versa. <laughs> and uh, that that just well, seems I, pretty ridiculous. your hair bills, Michael. That's what I did. <laughs> it seems crazy. pretty pretty ridiculous. Okay. It seems more likely if there's a multiverse that, uh, you know, it's these the other universe, other bubble universes unconnected to ours. But then the thing is good that could uh, reasonably re uh, retort like we do to them, uh, you know, you need to be more specific in step two here, referring to the Sidney Harris cartoon with the two mathematicians at the two scientists at the chalkboard with the masses of equations. And then and then a miracle happens in the middle. You know that we're accusing them of saying you're just making this leap of faith. There's no evidence for this. You're, you're just believing it. You're just asserting it. And they could then come back to something like this untestable string theory. Uh, you're just making this up, this multiverse thing. Now, but but to, to, to make a, a slight uh, point here to ask you this question, because Myers makes this point, as do other intelligent designers. You guys just made up this multiverse to avoid the inevitable conclusion that a deity is behind it all. And as I understand it, that's not where the multiverse comes from. It comes out of the equations or it's, it's a derivative of some mathematics or something like that. In, in other words, you weren't sitting around going, oh, crap, we're going to have to say that there's a God and I don't want that. So I'm going to make up this stuff about the multiverse. Well, right. So so exactly. It's, it's funny because these are relatives of the so-called Copernican principle. So in the I think it was the 500th anniversary of Copernicus's birth. Uh, there was a um, there was a, a kind of a fest shift, a party held for Copernicus <laughs> in uh, Krakow or. Yeah. And so um, there there were scientists, I think it's Brandon Carter, who came up with this proposal that he called the anthropic principle mm -hmm. that is sort of, you know, so the anthropic principle stands kind of opposite from the uh, from the Copernican principle. So it's kind of ironic birthday gift to get for uh, for old uh, Nicholas. Uh, but nevertheless, the the multiverse uh, emerges uh, from different phenomena than the string theory. That's actually true. So I would say string theory contains within it a more natural multiverse, which is called the landscape in the language of string theory, than does cosmology in the inflationary multiverse. Because hmm. um, if, if inflation took place, you can have inflation without a multiverse, but you can't have string theory without some form of a landscape. 
In other words, there is a more prolific, more extravagance in the landscape of string theory than the landscape of inflation. And part of the proof is of that is that you can have string inflation. So, well, you know, what's better than chocolate or peanut butter, right? Uh, you put them both together. And in the case of, you know, the string theory, it's, it's sort of even bigger in the sense that inflation can occur continuously for all eternity, whatever that means, in the multiverse. And that produces an infinite number by virtue of the fact that given, uh, you know, a finite cr probability uh, to create a universe per unit time times an infinite time, you'll produce infinite numbers of universes. Um, but in the string theory, it's actually impossible to put in what the what this you know initial condition or boundary conditions are for the uh, for the vast possibility hmm. of in in uh, of quantum mechanical states that string theory could could produce. The problem for me as a practicing cosmologist who doesn't you know is open to either scenario is that well what if it is true that we live in a multiverse? Um, so in that case, you know, is there any predictive power? Like can you can you even use as I said earlier the laws of logic? I mean. If, if there's a 100 prob percent probability that we exist in some other universe um, and we're doing opposite things, et cetera, like hair or podcast names or whatever, then um, then then there is no prior. In other words, it's basically everything can happen. That's not mathematically well defined. In other words, something that's mathematically mm. well defined should be subject to a, co a computer could solve it. And, uh, but computers can't solve things that are unbounded. You get this not a number like N.A.N. Um, which I used to think was like Nana, but it's not. It's uh, it, it means not a number, and so you, computers can't handle it. And so either mm. the universe is not computable, in that we can't encapsulate the full complexity of the universe on a computer, or uh, the problem is ill-defined, in that you have a, a measure, a mathematical term of a density of probability that has no is ill-defined. In other words, it, ha it doesn't operate in the normal laws of probability. And for that reason, I think it is true that it could be construed as almost hopeless. Like if I tell you, Michael, you're the chief of the NSF. And I said this to Kaku the other day. I said, you know, you've got um, you've got string theory on one hand and you've got um, you, you've got, uh, you know, effective quantum uh, quantum field theory on another. You got string theory and some alternative to it called effective field theory or Eric Weinstein has a geometric unity, et cetera, et cetera. You can only fund one. You know, what do you do? You're the mm. director of the National mm. Science Foundation. Oh, I think I think you should give it to both. But in, in this case, you maybe if you agree with him, that would be a huge raise for alternatives to string theory hmm. and a huge, huge, you know, tax on string theory, because it's basically almost in every physics department in the in the country. There's someone who understands and, and, and works on string theory. Hmm. And there's people that, you know, that believe in string cosmology. And so this is where it gets very dangerous. And I think, you know, people like Lee Smolin and others have written on this extensively, that physics has stagnated in a lot of hmm. ways. Fundamental physics, not not other fields yeah. of it. Yeah. Particle physics has stagnated. We haven't come up with a unified theory of, you know, so-called gravity uh, unified with other theories. Although, by the way, Michael, you know, people are really um, obsessed with the theory of everything, right? The TOE. But there's actually another theory that we also don't know, uh, and that's called the grand unified theory. Hmm. And my my point, and that's where the laws of the nuclear force, the electromagnetic force, and the weak nuclear force combine together uh, into one force, the same way that electricity and magnetism unify into one force. And then the theory of everything are those three forces married to the gravitational force, hmm. and that creates a theory of everything. So we're kind of looking past the goal lines right now. We're, <laughs> we're kind of like celebrating in the end zone. We haven't discovered a theory of grand unification yet, and yet we're kind of obsessed with string theory as the theory of everything. So and, you know, I just wonder if we're not putting, you know, Descartes before the horse. Uh -huh. Yeah. So the question is, is, is it just a really hard problem? And along the lines of what Steve Pinker commented, we just don't have a solar system size particle accelerator to figure out which is the right theory in a test. Therefore, um, we're just kind of making speculations or have, have you guys all gone down the wrong path? The string theorists, whatever, gone down the wrong path. Yeah. And, and, no. and, and there was that book like 10 years ago called Not Even wrong i forget the author's name um basically he was saying string Peter theory White. yeah Peter yeah White. yeah so it, that string theory is just completely off the rails and and you got to try something completely different so um 
we actually have a particle accelerator the size of the universe. Uh, it's funny when people say things like, oh, you just we just need a bigger particle accelerator. You know, 10 years ago, Michael, if I told you, um, would you like a particle accelerator that takes 10 to the 80th or 10 to the 20th nuclei and smashes them together, at, two of them together at the speed of light, you know, maybe 90 percent the speed of light? You'd say, hell yeah, that would be awesome. And it's called, you know, a, co a coalescing neutron star, hmm. you know, binary hmm. neutron star merger. And we detect them every day with with light. Hmm. Right. So it's like people think too small. We, oh, we actually okay. have the most advanced. We have, we have a particle accelerator that excel, it's galactic sized. It's called mm. a cosmic ray detector. Mm. Uh, we also have a potential detector of primordial waves of gravity, which I talk about in this month's article, in this quarter's article, which is uh, that we are looking for what is called the polarization of the cosmic microwave background radiation. Mm. And if we find a particular type of pattern of polarization, that would be indicative that not that the inflationary theory is right, but the alternatives are wrong. So it's actually a lot more hopeful than Pinker would lead us to believe in that we can actually make crisp falsification type tests, but not of the dominant paradigm. Hmm. So that's the interesting thing. There's no way to test the dominant paradigm as far as we can tell. And even by their own admission, even by the, uh, the Alan Guth's and, the, and Andre Linde's, uh, we cannot test uh, the theory, because any any time, and as um, there's one of the founders of string theory, along or one of the um, greatest contributors of string theory, um, who worked with Ed Witten on the so-called Cyberg-Witten equations, his name was uh, is Nathan Cyberg. He's at the Institute for Advanced Study, and he says most string theorists are very arrogant. He said with a smile, hmm. if there is something beyond string theory, we will call it string theory. So it's, <laughs> but the alternatives are not, that's not the case. We falsified the steady state. Mm -hmm. We can falsify the bouncing, you know, kind of re revisitations, reincarnations of steady state. And, uh, but we can't prove or even falsify the inflationary or string theory landscape proposals. So, you know, I ask you, well, you putting on your good Bayesian hat, if I tell you that all these other things are falsified, you know, what, what prior do you ascribe to the dominant par paradigm? That's one question. The other one is, if they're getting all the money, like, would you expect an alternative cosmology like Paul Steinhardt and Neil Turok uh, discuss? Or uh, would you expect, or Roger Penrose, even winner of this year's Nobel Prize in physics, would you expect that they would have as much attention as the dominant paradigm, even though the other paradigm is not is not testable in a falsification sense. In mm -hmm. other words, if you were just an intelligent funding director, you might say, well, I'm going to put some money in the thing I can at least prove wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, not all of my eggs in one or all of my dollars in one basket to be proven possibly right or confirmed. Interesting. So you're you're saying perhaps string theory as the dominant theory uh, is has gone down the wrong path and that we should shift some funding okay. over to these other areas. It's not clear that every incremental dollar uh, that you put into string theory would have as much impact as exploring alternatives or, you know, thinking of tests that could potentially prove it. It's not clear that it's hurting for funding, put it that way. Yeah. And I mean, it's certainly not hurting for publicity, right? I mean, it's certainly not yes. hurting for popularity yes. and um, publicity. <laughs> well, this is Michio's book. It's, it's, it, it hangs on string theory. Well, we'll see. If you like this video, please let me know what you thought in the comments. 